So the two words in Pali are, what is conditioned is Sankata. The word Sankata means it comes from the prefix Sam, which has the sense of together. A little bit like the English prefix come, like a committee, it's a meeting of people together, conference and talking together. 
conglomerate, things put together, combination. So like the count, so sound has similar meaning. And then kata is the past participle of the verb karoti, which means to make or to create. So what is sankata is something which is, you could say, composite, something which is put together, compounded, conditioned, fabricated, constructed. And then the opposite of that is asankata. The uh, is just simple negation. So that which is not put together, not composite, not created, not dependent upon other things as conditions. And so in the early Buddhist texts, the only thing which is really called asakata, unconditioned, is nibbana. Later traditions added sometimes space in the sense of infinite space as being unconditioned. But from the standpoint of Buddhist, Buddhist training, the important unconditioned element is Nibbāna. And the Noble Eightfold Path is something which is conditioned, that is, it arises through causes and conditions. Like the right view to arise, one has to do, one has to hear the teaching, for example, from some teacher, one has to reflect on it, one has to examine the principles, then one gains right view. And then all of the other path factors similarly depend upon causes and conditions. And so all of them, you would say the whole path, is something which is conditioned. Okay, sometimes the question arises, if Nibbāna is unconditioned, then how is it that in order to achieve Nibbāna, one practices the Noble Eightfold Path and then one attains Nibbāna? And so it seems that you could argue that therefore Nibbāna is conditioned. It depends on the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. But this is actually not really the case, but this is just, we could say, it's a resemblance of the truth. The actual way it works, well, I use an analogy. It's a little bit like New York City, and there's the Taconic Parkway. And so, <laughs> if you want to go to New York City, you take the Taconic Parkway, and when you get to the end of the Taconic Parkway, then the Bronx River Drive, whatever, you come to New York City. But we can't say that the Taconic Parkway brings New York City into being. New York City is, well, it's been there all along. But by driving along the Taconic Parkway, one reaches New York City. And so Nibbana, as the unconditioned, is always there. But unless one practices the Noble Eightfold Path, one doesn't attain it. And so we say the Noble Eightfold Path is the way to the unconditioned. But it doesn't bring the unconditioned into existence. Okay, so the Noble Eightfold Path is conditioned. Then we come to the next question. Visaka asks, are the three aggregates included by the Noble Eightfold Path, or is the Noble Eightfold Path included by the three aggregates? Okay, now what is meant by aggregates here? We've come across the word aggregate, in relation to the factors that make up a living being, then we speak about the five aggregates. So the five aggregates we know the form, feeling, perception, the volitional activities, and consciousness. But here it's the same word in Pali, but it's being used in a different application. Here the word aggregate, three aggregates, refers to what are called the three groups of training or practice in Buddhism. So we speak about the three training aggregates as being the aggregate of sila or ethical behavior. 
Then comes the aggregate of concentration or samadhi. And then the aggregate of wisdom. And so all of the practices and trainings that are undertaken in order to develop one's ethical behavior, that belongs to the aggregate of ethical behavior. All of the factors of training that one undertakes in order to achieve samadhi or concentration, they belong to the aggregate of samadhi, the aggregate of concentration. And all of the factors of training that one undertakes in order to generate wisdom belong to the aggregate of wisdom. So we have these three trainings and the way they usually set out, they set out somewhat in a sequential structure. So the, the aggregate of ethical behavior is the base of foundation. Based on that foundation, one undertakes the training to gain samadhi or concentration. In other words, to collect the mind, to bring the mind together and make it unified. And then one uses the unified or concentrated mind in order to gain direct insight. That becomes the training in wisdom. Okay, so now we have, in a way, a little problem here. That the Buddha laid out his training and sometimes by way of the three aggregates, the three stages of training, sometimes in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path. And so now Visaka is asking Dhammadina how these two schemes relate to one another. Does the Noble Eightfold Path fit into the three trainings? Or do the three trainings fit into the Noble Eightfold Path? Okay, and Dhammadina explains that the three aggregates are not included by the Noble Eightfold Path, but the Noble Eightfold Path is included in the three aggregates. In other words, the three aggregates are, you say, it's a broader group of categories into which the more finely divided scheme of the Noble Eightfold Path can be fit. And then she goes on to elaborate and she says, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, these three factors are included in the aggregate of virtue or ethical behavior. It's Siva. Then right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, these three factors are included in the aggregate of concentration. So you see the aggregate of concentration includes three factors and only one of them is concentration itself. But the other two, right effort and right mindfulness, are, you can say that they're the means for developing concentration. And so they all, those three work together, and so they all fit together into the aggregate of concentration. The right view and right intention or right purpose these are included in the aggregate of wisdom. So actually, right view in the higher sense as direct insight is identical with wisdom. So direct personal experiential insight is wisdom. But in order to develop that penetrating experiential wisdom, one begins with right view, with right intention or motivation, and as one develops these two, they turn into direct insight or wisdom, and so they are included in the aggregate of wisdom. Now it's interesting, if you open 
any textbook on basic Buddhism when it comes to an explanation of the Noble Eightfold Path, what they'll tell you is the eight factors of the path, right speech, right action, right livelihood, going to the training in virtue, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, go into the concentration of wisdom, uh, the training in concentration, and right view and right intention, go into the training of wisdom. Even, like in Sri Lanka, I know, like, you know, the textbook for third grade students, you know, the students 10 years old, 11 years old, studying Buddhism in the Dharma school, when they open their textbook, they'll get this. <laughs> And you ask, like, almost any knowledgeable Buddhist, in, especially in the Theravada Buddhist countries, how do you arrange the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path into the three groups? And they'll tell you just like it is here. But the only place in the whole Sutta Vitaka where I've seen this way of dividing the eight factors is this passage here. <laughs> And it's not spoken by the Buddha himself, but by the Bhikkhuni Dhammadima. So it's a little bit puzzling how that became so universal. You know, we have a whole group collection of suttas on the Noble Eightfold Path in the Sanyutta Nikaya. Something like about 50 or 60 pages of suttas. And none of them mention how the eight factors of the path fit into the three trainings. Only this one place. Okay, so now the questioner, Visaka, is going to try to focus in on the training in samadhi or concentration. So he asks Visaka now, what is concentration? What is the basis of concentration? What is the equipment of concentration? And what is the development of concentration? So we have four questions here, all concerned with different aspects of samadhi concentration. And so first, Dhammadina gives an explanation of concentration, or we might say a definition. She says that concentration is unification of mind. The Pali word is actually chitas e kangata. Chitta is the mind, and the word ekagata comes from eka, which means one, aga, which can mean point or tip, and the tala just makes it an abstract now. So, unification of mind is called unification of mind, literally means one pointedness of mind. And that, in a way, indicates what one is doing when one is cultivating samadhi or concentration. Usually, we can say that the mind moves in different directions. It's scattered or distracted. And so to develop samadhi, one takes a single object, a simple object, usually at the beginning, and one just brings the mind back again and again to that object. 
So we can say that that object is the point that one has to keep the mind centered on. So for example, we could take the breath. Someone has the sensation of the breath coming in and going out. And whenever the mind roams and wanders, one remembers, ah, I've lost the object. Then one brings the mind back to the breath, the in-breath, out-breath. If one is following the rising and falling of the abdomen, again, when the mind wanders, bring the mind back to rising, falling, rising, falling. If one is doing a casino meditation, the round circular disc, colored disc, everything circular is round. <laughs> a circular, usually circular colored disc, Whenever the mind wanders, one brings the mind back to that object. So whatever object one takes, when the mind wanders, one brings the mind back again and again. And then as one goes on continuing the, to bring the mind back to the object, over time one develops the ability to sustain the mind on that object. And that sustained attention to the object that sustained awareness of the object is samadhi or concentration. And so we then say that the mind is no longer scattered, no longer distracted, but it's become one-pointed or unified. Okay, so that is the meaning of concentration. But it has to be, for it to be the real samadhi, it has to be a wholesome unification of mind. You know, like people may be, you know, like say, <laughs> from years ago when the young girls would go to the Beatles concert or the Rolling Stones concert, they're completely absorbed in what's going on. <laughs> the mind is completely unified <laughs> on the Beatles. <laughs> favorite Beatle or the favorite Rolling Stone, <laughs> but that's not Samadhi. <laughs> or you can see sometimes somebody is listening to the rock music and they probably, you know, the world could be collapsing on all sides but they're sitting there. Or I see people on the train. <laughs> Everybody now has their little box that looks like this. Well, it's square, but rectangular like this. And they're all going <laughs> <laughs> tapping, tapping, tapping. <coughs> you know, an earthquake would be taking place, but <laughs> tap, 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 tap. <laughs> so it's a kind of concentration, but it's not really what we call the wholesome unification of mind. So now we have the two other questions. The next two questions should be taken together. One is what is called the basis of concentration. The other is the equipment of concentration. And the basis of concentration is said to be the four foundations of mindfulness. We, yeah, we've explained these already. That's the body, feelings, states of mind, and the mental phenomena. So it's by attending to these four foundations of mindfulness that one develops concentration. So these four are the basis, you can say the foundations, or objective domains for developing this concentration of the Noble Eightfold Path. And then the equipment are called the four right kinds of striving, or other work, in other words, the four right efforts. This is the effort to prevent the arising of unwholesome mental states that have not yet arisen. The effort to abandon unwholesome mental states that have already arisen. The effort to bring into being 
wholesome mental states that have not yet arisen and the effort to maintain wholesome mental states that have already arisen. And so in the practice aimed at samadhi, we actually have these two factors, right mindfulness and right effort or right striving, work hand in hand together. <clears throat> For example, if you have the awareness of the breath as the meditation of object, uh, as the object of meditation, <clears throat> so that is part of the foundation of the body. The body is the foundation for mindfulness. And so you're keeping the attention, the awareness on the breath, mindful, breathe in, mindfully breathe out, mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out. When the mind wanders, you become aware that the mind is wandering, that's a kind of mindfulness. And then you bring the mind back to the breath, that's a kind of mindfulness. Then you become aware of the breath again, in, out, in, out. If you're attending to the feelings or sensations in the body, you might be observing a particular sensation or feeling that is your foundation of mindfulness. When the mind wanders to something else, you become aware of the wandering mind, then you bring the mind back to the sensations, that is re-establishing mindfulness. So this is how right mindfulness becomes the basis for concentration. But in order to keep the mind on the object and to bring the mind back to the object when you lose it, it takes a certain mental energy that is called right effort. This is why the practice of meditation, you know, it seems so simple. You just sit there, keep your mind on the breath. After all, you've studied for finished university, master's degree, doctor's degree, you're working maybe six hours, eight hours, ten hours a day at a job. But just to sit, that could be a complex, demanding job, just to sit and be aware of the breath coming in and out, child's play. <laughs> right? <laughs> but when you try to do it, it's very difficult. So it takes a lot of effort or energy. And that is right effort. But then when you get the mind to stay on the breath for some time, then you can feel actually the body and the mind suffuse with tremendous energy. So that shows how the mind, how the right effort or energy is building up through the practice of mindfulness. And so these two, mindfulness and effort, work hand in hand together. And when they come together successfully, then there comes the unification of mind, <coughs> samadhi or concentration. So in a way I've already answered the fourth question, what is the development of concentration? And then the answer is the repetition, development and cultivation of the same states is the development of concentration. That is the development of the four foundations of mindfulness and the four light efforts working together. That is what brings, brings concentration into being and it helps to maintain right concentration. Okay, before we go further, maybe I'll ask whether at this point there's any, there are any questions. Okay, there's some internet questions. Just okay. Write it down. <laughs> I think 
Monday. Yeah. Uh, what what if, if the answer is the mm-hmm. the logo with four parties and condition? But do you think that would be uh, uh, the wrong way to define that? If the logo with four parties and the condition? Because that definitely actually is a quite a very discussion in the uh, in, in security reason. In where? In, in, in different schools. Because some school, uh, in Chinese, I record that actually some school claim that that should be an condition. It's a normal info path. Yes. Oh, this I'm not aware of. <laughs> but other schools reject that and criticize that? I think because they, they I might remember is the, the answer is that when they are unconditioned, it's, it should be claimed as unconditioned. It should be what? It should be unconditioned because the noble play for God definitely need to Nirvana I should be understand as unconditioned. Yeah, but it seems, I mean, it's, <laughs> to me it's clear that the noble eightfold path has to be conditioned because one brings it into being through okay. establishing the right conditions. Okay, let's see. Okay, first question, is the verb karoti, as I wrote on the board, related to the word karma? Yes, definitely. The word karma is derived from karoti. Karoti means to do, and karma originally meant deed or doing. Second question, does unification of mind lead to seeing the interconnectedness of everything and thus there is no more conflict and paradox and this leads to dissolving all doubts so that the third fetter is removed. Yet here we're talking only about unification of mind. At this point there's no kind of insight or seeing into anything or any kind of wisdom. But this is just how to bring the mind together and keep it focused on its object. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's good to take that uh, mobile microphone. Thank you. Um, one, one can be concentrated. I mean, you were talking about yeah. teenagers focusing on Beatles, which you know, it's, yeah. it's frivolous, but one could be concentrated on something that's creative, such yeah. as writing or yeah. creating okay. music or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there a difference between yeah. this kind of concentration and that kind uh, of concentration? Question. Yeah. And, and what's the value of this concentration in, in its abstract kind of form? Because that's all you're talking about is concentration without concentrating on anything but breath. Okay, yeah. This Where's is it going? Good. Okay. Yeah, this is a, a, a good question. Maybe, uh, maybe I gave almost the impression that any kind of concentration on something that is non-meditative is an unwholesome concentration, which is not the case. I think it's a little, it's the use of the word concentration to render samadhi, which is a little bit misleading because a word like samadhi takes place within the framework, the Indian framework of what we might call higher states of mental development for which we don't really have precise counterparts in English. And so we have to use makeshift words in order to render these words from Indian languages. And so the word samadhi would have a very special connotation within the context not only of Buddhism, but in Indian spirituality in general. It doesn't mean simply that the mind is focused on something to the point that where it's not distracted by anything else, but it means that the mind is focused on something in a way which elevates the mind to, you might call this, to higher states of consciousness. And so samadhi is really, it's a higher state of consciousness by which, which is achieved through focusing the mind upon a single object. But it has to be done within a particular setting and bringing it to play. <coughs> to pl- excuse me. <coughs> bringing into play certain supporting factors. Okay, and 
So in order to develop samadhi, one chooses one object of a, usually there's like a whole class of, could be 40 objects, more than 40 objects, so we can even multiply those further. But one chooses an object and then one just brings the mind back to that object again and again, not simply for the purpose of attending to that object per se, but because that method provides this a means for elevating consciousness to a higher level and unfolding deeper hidden potentials of the mind. So that is, and then these higher states of consciousness usually are accompanied by, say, extremely pleasant feelings, ex- feelings of unusual happiness, joy, bliss, even ecstasy. And then within the Buddha's training, the concentrated mind forms the instrument for developing insight or wisdom. And so it's, in some of the Indian systems, samadhi seems to be an end in itself. The goal is to get into these deep meditative absorptions. But in the Buddha's training, one first develops the samadhi, the mental unification, and then one uses that unified mind in order to investigate and examine the nature of the body and the mind in order to see them directly and gain intuitive insight. It's a little bit like maybe developing samadhi is like sharpening a knife, a kitchen knife, (laughs) and then Developing wisdom with the samadhi is like using the kitchen knife to cut up the vegetables for cooking a meal. Thank you. Or maybe to use another analogy, maybe developing samadhi, it's like focusing, you have a microscope and say a biologist wants to study a sample of cells. I'm assuming that he's using one of these optical microscopes where you actually use the eye. Maybe they've developed new style of microscopes beyond what I used to use when I was a little boy. <laughs> okay, but first you have to focus the microscope. That is like samadhi. And then you look, when you look through it, then you can examine the specimen in order to see what the cells look like. So that is like insight or wisdom. Uh, did somebody, somebody start to speak? Okay, then we go on to the next. In that question. Excuse me? No, I answered the two questions. Okay, now we come to a new set of questions. In a way, this is branches off from samadhi, questions on samadhi. This is about, yeah, I'm not so happy with this word, but with the translation. But again, the word concerns what are called sankharas. Sankhara is also from sam plus karoti, from things that are made together, that make together.
So the word sankara, again, it comes from making or putting together. <coughs> Formations doesn't really suggest very much. Now I actually render the word sankara activity. Activities. So it doesn't mean that one has to be up and doing something, but it can be very subtle mental activities. Some use composition, compositional factors, conditioning factors, constructions, fabrications. But what's important is to know what these three sankharas are. So Visakha says, how many formations or sankharas are there? And Dhammadina answers, there are these three sankharas. The bodily sankhara, that's kaya sankhara. The verbal activity, that's vachi sankhara. And the mental activity, that is um, chitta sankhara. Okay, then Visaka asks, what are, what are each of these sankharas? And Dhammadina says, first, in breathing and out breathing are the bodily sankhara, the bodily activity. Applied thought and sustained thought. We could say thinking and reflection, thought and examination are the verbal activity verbal formation and perception and feeling are the mental activity or the mental formation okay then Visaka says why are each of these things called a particular type of sankhara and then Dhammadina explains that in breathing and out breathing are bodily they pertain to the body and these states are bound up with the body. They actually depend upon the body. So we breathe in and out because we have a body. There are activities of the body. And so in breathing and out breathing are called the bodily activity. Okay, then why are applied thought and sustained thought or thought and examination called the verbal activity. That is, first one thinks and examines, or thinks and reflects, and then subsequently one breaks out into speech. So when we speak, always there are thoughts underlying the, the speech. If you were to pass a chair and the chair were to start talking to you, <laughs> what would conclusion would you come to about the chair? Artificial intelligence. <laughs> but suppose, well, <laughs> it were to call you by name, ask how you are today, and he said, I'm feeling good, and it says, oh, I'm feeling good too. What's making you feel good today? If you say, oh, I'm feeling miserable today, the chair would to say, why are you feeling so miserable? You should chair up, it's a nice day. <laughs> then you would think that the chair has this thinking. <laughs> it has a mind of its own. perception and feeling called the mental formation because their mental, their states bound up with the mind. That's why they're called the mental formation or the mental activity. I have to say, I also say that we don't find, you know, the kind of detailed explanations here that you might find if you were looking at a modern textbook on cognitive psychology where each of these questions would get like about a 10 page explanation. But this is just the style of the early discourses because this is material that has to be transmitted orally by memorization. 
Okay, so now this is going to be leading into a discussion on a particular meditative state called the cessation of perception and feeling. This is like regarded as the highest meditative state in which all feeling and perception, all mental activity come to a complete stop or cessation. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I think for most of us, maybe with a few exceptions, <laughs> it's beyond our reach. And so I think you know, we have to deal with more practical things. But if anybody feels that they're on the verge of attaining <laughs> the cessation of perception and feeling, I think it's time to go to the forest of Burma or Thailand and find a meditation master there who has experience of those states. Okay, so we'll just go through it a bit quickly. So, Visaka asks, how does the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling come about? And then Dhammadina says, when a monk is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, it does not occur to him, I will attain it, or I am attaining it, or I have attained the cessation of perception and feeling, but rather his mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads him to that state. So what has to be done to achieve the cessation of perception and feeling, what first has to have mastered the four jhanas, and then beyond that, the four formless meditations. Then one attains each of those meditations, contemplates it with insight as being impermanent, bound up with suffering and non-self. Then one goes on to the next attainment, again enters it, masters it, contemplates it as a permanent suffering non-self till one goes up to the eighth attainment, the base of neither, actually one goes to the seventh attainment, the base of nothingness. <laughs> then one decides, I want to enter the base but what, I want to enter the cessation of perception and feeling. Then what makes the determinate what makes that determination, then one enters the base of neither perception nor non-perception and goes through a few turns of that, and then perception and feeling and all mental activity come to a stop. One enters the base one enters the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling for the predetermined time. One determines how long one wants to stay in that state, whether a half an hour, an hour, two hours, three hours, 24 hours, and then one will remain in that state. Then as soon as the predetermined time comes to an end, then one automatically emerges from it. Okay, so then Visaka asks, here's where the discussion of the activity is coming. When a monk is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, which states sees first in him? The bodily activity, the verbal activity, or the mental activity? Then Dhammadina explains, when a monk is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, First, the verbal activity ceases. Where does the verbal activity cease? First, first one, second jhana. Second you can't give a choice, you have to make it the exact. Second, second. second jhana. Right, the second jhana. Because in the, when one moves to the second jhana, then fitaka and vichara, applied and sustained thought, stop. Okay, then the bodily formation ceases. Where does the bodily formation cease? The bodily activity. In and out breathing. Maybe we haven't 
bad like that. But everybody wants to take a guess. No. At this fourth, at this fourth jhana. Yeah, it's the, said to be the fourth jhana. And the fourth, as one goes through the successive jhanas, the breathing becomes more and more subtle. Until it said, when one goes into the fourth jhana, the breathing stops. Then the mental formation, where does that stop? No, in either perception or non-perception, there's still very subtle perception and feeling. Cessation of perception. Yeah, it's in the cessation of feeling and perception that feeling and perception cease. I do have a question. During that jhana, there's no mindfulness. In. In the, in the cessation of, of perception and, and yeah, in the cessation of perception and feeling, there's no mindfulness. Okay. <laughs> it's not a state of loss of forgetfulness. So it's just that all mental activity comes to an end, including mindfulness. But it's reached after reaching the subtlest development of mindfulness. In order to get there, one has to develop mindfulness to the subtlest level. But then when one goes into that state, the mindfulness itself also stops. Okay, then, next question is, when the monk is emerging from the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling, uh, how does the emergence from the attainment of cessation and feeling come about? Then the answer is, Again, when he's emerging from the attainment, it doesn't occur to him, I will emerge, I am emerging, or I have emerged. But his mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads him to that state. In other words, he's made a prior, before he went into the state, he makes that prior determination I will remain for one hour, two hours, three hours. Then when the time comes to an end, even without his thinking about it, automatically he comes out. How that happens, I don't know, but it's a little bit like maybe you might go to sleep and you don't set the alarm clock, but you make the determination, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. <laughs> and then it takes a little practice, but once you get accustomed to that. As soon as 5 a.m. comes, you automatically wake up. How does it happen? You're not, so you're not cheating, like opening one eye while you're asleep and looking at the clock. You haven't set the alarm clock. Nobody is waking you up. But just somehow the mind gets trained that in such a way that as soon as 5 o'clock comes, you wake up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is an analogy to what happens with this attainment of cessation. Okay, so when the monk is emerging from the attainment of cessation, perception, and feeling, what of these activities arise in him first? So, first the mental activity arises, then the bodily activity, then the verbal activity. Where does the mental activity arise? As he's coming out. Maybe I should try to answer it in that way. Okay, but he comes out from the attainment of cessation. First there's perception and feeling. Then he starts breathing again, and then thought and examination occur, vitaka and vichara. Okay, this is a little bit of an obscure question, the next one. Again, the, these questions are at a very high level. 
when the monk has emerged from the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling, how many kinds of contact touch him? What kind of, what does he ex contact? What does he experience? And then she answers, when the monk has emerged from the attainment of perception and feeling, three kinds of contact touch him, or he experiences three kinds of contact. One is called voidless contact, Another is signless contact. The third is desireless contact. Now what is explained, to understand this, one has to look at the commentary. And the commentary explains that when the meditator comes out from the attainment of cessation, the first thing that is experienced is Nibbana. The state of mind arises in which one experiences Nibbana. It's actually a fruition attainment that one experiences. And Nibbana is experienced in either of three ways. Either it's experienced as voidness or emptiness, or it's experienced as, as voidness or emptiness in the sense of that which has no substance, no um, substantial nature is experienced as signless, that which has no identifying characteristics or signs, or is experienced as the desireless, that in which there's no desires, no wishes. And so it said that when one emerges from the attainment of cessation, just there's this brief fleeting experience of Nibbana, and then one comes back into normal states of consciousness or ordinary states of consciousness. But then after, the next question, after the monk has emerged from the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling, to what does his mind incline? To what does it, tend, what does it lean to? What does it tend to? And then she answers, after emerging from the attainment of cessation, the mind inclines to seclusion, leans to seclusion, tends to seclusion. And what's meant by seclusion here, again, according to the commentary, is this, that experience of Nibbana. And so after emerging from the cessation of perception and feeling, the perception of feeling of, I'm sorry, the cessation of perception and feeling itself is not an experience of Nibbana. But when one comes out of it, one has this momentary experience of Nibbana. One comes back to an ordinary state of consciousness and then the mind has this leaning or inclination towards Nibbana, towards the experience of Nibbana. Okay, I'm explaining according to, partly according to the commentary, partly to my own understanding, but don't say, can't you speak from your own experience about this? I'm afraid not. <laughs> Anybody have any other things? Maybe, do you know any discussions about this in Mahavibhasa? Yeah, they have lots. Uh, anyway, I, I have a question. What is seclusion in the Pali word? The Pali word for seclu seclusion? It's Viveka. Okay. Okay, I'll ask for questions here at this point. The, 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 the mobile microphone. Thank you. Um, the cessation of breathing is that is not to be taken literally. That is that is one is ceases to be aware of one's breathing. Is that correct? That's an interesting question. And the way I mean, one, one needs to breathe, otherwise it's understood, it's very long. Yeah, it's understood in the text that one stops breathing. <laughs> but I know physiologically it's said that breath is necessary. So I I'm just wondering whether this means that the breath becomes so subtle that it seems as if it's not occurring. 
The thing is, oxygen is necessary. Breathing is not necessary. You can have oxygen in your body. It you could be that. Consume a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Like, it could be that in this state of the fourth jhana, the body is able to use oxygen in a much slower and more frugal way than when we're in an ordinary state of consciousness. Or it could be that the body is getting the oxygen it needs by breathing through the pores of the skin. I don't know, it, well, it, I just know all it does, all the text says is in the fourth jhana, the sasa, the sasa, in breathing, out breathing, cease. Um, there are lots of Hindu stories of people ceasing their breathing, like, and, and, and seen demonstrations of, like, of, of, of yogas uh, standing up with their heads in the sand, with their faces completely covered for like 18 hours at a stretch, supposedly not breathing at all. So, I'm so I could say, if one has the head in the sand, it wouldn't be very comfortable. But <laughs> one could still... Might be possible. Excuse me? Yeah, may be possible if they're really yeah. breathing. To do the experiment really effectively, what we would have to do would be to put a gag over somebody's, a really, like, a tight rubber gag over their nostrils and block the nostrils completely. Well, not, a, not only the nostrils, but the mouth. Did, um, did you bring up the next No, no, I'm fine. I know, I know, years ago, maybe in the 1970s, I heard of experiments like this done on yogis, Indian yogis, and I think that they indicated that they weren't breathing in the state of samadhi. So it could be the case. I have two questions. Go. First one, uh, what is the Pali word for whiteness here? Is this it's, it's sunyata. Is this? It's it is sunyata. It's sunyata, which usually translated as emptiness. But it, it has a different meaning from what we normally know as sunyata. Well, let us say that <laughs> the use of the word sunyata comes originally from the early suttas, and then it becomes sort of elaborated in Prajna Paramita sutras and then in Nagashima. So it takes on maybe different meanings as it gets elaborated. But here it's being used in relation to Nibbana. Anyway, there's one sutta which speaks about Nibbana as being void or empty, and that it's empty of greed, empty of hatred, empty of delusion. But I don't know whether that really goes far enough. I would say also that there's a sense of what I would call maybe a metaphysical emptiness, that it doesn't have any of the the features of conditioned reality to it. So in that sense, it's experienced as a state of emptiness. And also, at this stage, when, um, when one exit the uh, state of uh, no perception and, and, and feeling, one has the experience of Nibbana. Yeah. Uh, does insight have anything to, is, is, has insight taken place at this point? And I ask this question because it seems to me that all it requires is to reach the A. No, no. If you remember when I was explaining the way to enter cessation of feeling and perception, as one is undertaking the process aimed at entering it, one develops each jhanic state, then one emerges and contemplates it as impermanent, suffering and non-self. Then one goes into the next one, contemplates it as impermanent, suffering, non-self, through all eight levels. Actually, first through the seven levels, then I guess the eighth is subsumed under that. And in order to achieve, it's said to in order to achieve the cessation of perception and feeling, one has to be either a non-returner or an arhat. Other people can't achieve it. And so it does require the strength of the insight or wisdom which has brought a person to the level of non-returner or arahat. So a non-Buddhist, in the most strict sense of not having the insight that Buddha yeah. taught, yeah. that person cannot reach the eighth 
No, no. It's not that there's a certain like religious label that gives one a pass to this thing, <laughs> but one has to develop the insights, the spe specific insights of impermanent dukkha and non-self, and reach those levels of realization, the third and fourth levels of realization. Any further questions? I mean, I'll take internet questions. I think this is the internet question. Okay. He says, if, as I understand it, samadhi is a higher state of consciousness achieved by focusing on a single object but the focusing itself is not samadhi. I have heard the word samatha. Would that be a word, the word for the process of focusing? Actually, I think the word samatha is really equivalent to samadhi. But what would be called the process of focusing would be called, you can call it samadhi bhavana, which means development of samadhi, or samatha bhavana the development of serenity or tranquility. So bhavana is the word that means development and the process of focusing is part of the process of development. So we can say that the focusing is part of bhavana. Question one, question two. Is it attainment of cessation of perception of feeling Referring to the attainment of the arahats, does it mean the cessation or abandoning of consciousness too? Is the ego self still there? I, I already said that this attainment is of cessation of feeling perception. It's said to be accessible to non-returners and to arahats. And the non-returner still has a subtle sense of the ego self, though no longer any view of the ego self. But of course, within the attainment, there's no longer any sense of ego self. It's completely silence. Okay, one more question. Is Visaka's question about the three formations intended to explore the cessation of human existence, the ending of samsara, the end of the bodily, verbal and consciousness formation. No, I don't take it in that sense. These are the three, the question about the three formations is intended to lead into the discussion of the attainment of, of this meditative state, cessation <clears throat> cessation of feeling and perception. Okay then. Okay then, another question. Some commentaries match voidness, signless and desireless to the particular emphasis of the yogi on <laughs> the natta, non-self, anicca, impermanence and dukkha or suffering. How, oh, here there is no such association. Yeah, this association comes in, I think the first work to mention it is a kind of commentarial work included in the Sutta Bhittaka called Patisabhita Magga. So it said that those meditators who emphasize impermanence you know, to reach any stage of enlightenment, one has to focus on all three characteristics. But some meditators give more attention to one than to the others. So those who give more attention to impermanence, when they realize Nibbana, will experience it as the signless, without any kind of fixed characteristic. Those who give attention to the characteristic of suffering will experience Nibbana as the desireless. Because when you focus on suffering, then all craving or desire gets 
eliminated. And those who give attention to non-self will experience Nibbana as emptiness, because emptiness means the absence of any self. But this comes in commentarial <coughs> texts, not in the suttas themselves. Okay, I think we'll close or stop for the day. And now we won't have a class next week, because next week we have the memorial service for Bendel Renju, the old master of Bodhi Monastery, who passed away a few days ago in Taiwan. Um, so we'll have the next Sutta class in two weeks. That should be February 26th. Today is the 12th. Okay, we'll do it the 26th. Have the next class the 26th. And we'll certainly we'll finish this Sutta then. And if I finish in advance, then we can do, I should do a short one. Emails we've been receiving have suggested that that one was supposed to be reading Sutta number 48. Oh, did it say today? Yes. It said 48. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. I know that the one they've sent out yeah. was the last week. Yeah. <laughs> we can't blame anybody because my original program would have said last week that we should have been taking 48, but we've been taking more time on this Sutta. That expected. The email the guideline. Yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we could do, maybe we could fit in 48 next week. Maybe finish 47, not next, in two weeks. Finish 47, and if time allows, we could take 48. 47? Did I say 47? Yes. Yeah. 44. Yeah, we finished 44. It doesn't hurt to <laughs> everybody to read 47. It's not hard. And, um, I mean, it's useful to read. And it's short, so if... Anyway, we'll see you next week for two weeks. But I think we'll try to do the end of 44 and 48. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merits. And I want particularly to share the merits from today's class with Vendel Renjun Fasher, with whom I stayed for about four and a half years at Bodhi Monastery and wish him a happy voyage, a peaceful voyage to his next existence. And we also share the merits with the Devas, Buddhas, and all beings. Akasatachabhumata Devanagamhitika Punyanta Nanumotipa Chirangra Kantu Sasana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumotipa Chirangra Kantu Desana Akasata Chabumata Pernagamahitika punyanta nanumodipa Chirangra kantu mang parangeta vata charam hei Sampadam punya sampadam Sabe devanumodam tu Sava sampati siddhya eta vata charam hei Sampadam punya sampadam Sabe Buddhana Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vata Chaam Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Sadhanu Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya 
Tathagupadaya vichetato etantare satakayu papana rupia rupicha samya samino dukha pavuchantu pusantu nibhuti. Okay.